Um, Justine Joy Minos, Aoife Bolster. Tell me a little bit about your project. Our project is about investigating the effects of metal ions on E. coli it, because manufacturers are putting silver into sports gear and silver is very expensive so it is so we're testing cheaper metals to see if they would work the same way. And what were your results? Our results was very good. The iron worked the best. If you add more iron, the bacteria might kill it most and some of the metals didn't really work properly. What were the bad ones? The bad ones was um, copper sulfate probably. And how long did it take you to get uh, the information? Well, we've been doing the project just since September, so we have. So we've just carried through since September. Tell me a little bit about uh, the stuff you have here on the table. The stuff we have is a balance scale. We use the balance scale to measure out our chemicals with a weighing boat accurately, so we can measure it accurately to put in our solutions. This project now, I'm not a scientist, but this project seems to me to have a, a really good output um, and it's the sort of thing that I would have thought that maybe some of the big manufacturers or shoe manufacturers whatever could take on. Is that your hope? Yeah, it is. We're just like hoping to save money for the world and stuff for like things in, that need help, like people in Africa. So we tested cheaper metals. I'm Kennedy. I'm Nicole. And your school? St Mary's College in Derry. Okay, tell me a little bit about your project, please. Our project is testing different salts to see which would melt snow and ice on the roads fastest. So obviously a very practical thing. Yes, and we found out that calcium chloride is the best and it goes to below minus 20 degrees. And how did you find that out? We made standard solutions of 250 millilitres of deionised water and we put 1 gram, 2 gram, 3 gram and 4 gram and a 4 standard solutions. We then poured 50 millilitres and a, a conical flask, hooked them up to the data logger and then put it in the fridge, left it overnight and let the data logger monitor, monitor it and then in the morning we would take it out of the freezer and then let it melt and then it would still be monitored by the data logger. Sounds fascinating, but what made you choose this project? It was last year whenever it was really bad snow and ice, so we decided that it was, we were getting sick of the snow, so we thought we would pick, like, see which salt would help it and everything it would do. Uh, did it take you long then to find, get your results? It was like two or three months, that's all it took, because it was just within a week we got our results from our first experiment with sodium chloride, and the next week it was magnesium chloride and the next calcium chloride but then the last couple of weeks then was just making our graphs and our poster and our booklet. St Mary's College, Derry. And your name? Lavina. Tell me a little bit about your project. This project is about how accurately doses of medicine are measured. Many people do not measure <laughs> The, do not use the measuring device to supply it with the medication and tend to reach for ones from the cuddler drawer and I was wondering how accurate was this. I did my test, my method and I figured out when you use spoon from a cuddler drawer it isn't that accurate. You're only getting half of your dose which isn't killing off the bacteria. Well, tell me a little bit about the importance of getting the dose right. Well, if you don't get your dose right then it's not going to kill off whatever you have, like your bacteria or whatever sack or the bugs you have. So I, so you should be getting the right amount and the right spoon to use would be the one that comes along with your medication. Because if you get too low a dose then you're gonna, it's going to be ineffective and not kill a bacteria. If you get too high a dose it's going to run the risk of liver damage. So you're better just to get the correct dose. And what's the range between too little and too much? On my project, uh, um, well, it would be from what 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 where, what are you basing it on? Is it five mil? Uh, five milliliters, yes. But uh, the ones that were supplied with medication are more accurate than the ones that were you could get from the cuddler drawer. And what's it? I see you have a lot of spoons out here. What's the difference in in, in dosage with those? Uh, see, I asked loads of people. They measure out what they thought was uh, 
was five milliliters and put it in to the beaker and see what it, uh, on the measuring scales to see what it was because if they've lost the plastic wee spoons come along with medicine then they might you know, use an alternative which would be these and uh, it's a big range the range was from see here you know when they like it was from under two they way above to seven Wow, so that's massive range, isn't it? So you could actually be only taking half the amount of medicine you need. Yes, that's, that's, what, it, that's what my figures are showing on the results, that you're only taking that amount. So this is obviously a very important thing and obviously very important uh, from a personal point of view for somebody who takes medicine. How do you try to develop this into from an idea into something which can be actually practical and people use? Well, I'm just telling people from my results that uh, not to use the ones from a corridor at all because it, you're not, it's never going to be accurate. And it, my result, it's just showing that it's more or less underdosing every time. So you'd be better because these the spoons that are supplied with the medication are way more accurate. Some of them are slightly overdosing, but not by much, but they're more accurate, definitely. So, so I suppose it's all about letting people know. That's the important thing, is it? Yes, definitely. And have you thought about that, how you might do that? I, uh, I was going to go to the hospital and uh, I was going to set up a thing with the hospital and ask, ask them. I was going to make posters because they do art and I was going to put it out. Do they always use them spoons? Definitely. So a project which obviously is very worthwhile. How long have you been working on it? Uh, well, I'm third year now and I've been doing it since when I started back in September. That was part two to do with the bacteria and all last year I did the first part of my project. So, you? And have you enjoyed it? Yes, I've enjoyed it. What have been the highlights? Uh, getting to take part in the competition, and I was really scared when the judges came round. But like, it feels really good then, because like, I did I won runner up in Letterkenny. It feels good to know that you know your work was actually appreciated, so it was good. Uh, St Mary's College. And your names? Grace. Haley. So tell me a little bit about the project. Well our project's about a form of dementia called Alzheimer's and we decided to do this because there was a lot of it on the media about like celebrities parents having Alzheimer's and the former president of the USA had it so we thought it was a very common thing to do so we wanted to look into it in more detail and we used uh, vitamins and we were testing them there too as well in our project. So is this about looking at the causes of it? Well, we looked into the causes of it, and there's not one specific cause because science doesn't know a whole lot about it just yet. It's um, not, it's not as uh, researched. But um, one of the things we found is that hydrogen peroxide, it it um, causes plaques and tangles in the brain. Uh, but there's an enzyme called catalase, and it breaks it down into um, oxygen. Look, if you see here, we have the equation of the the oxygen and the water. And um, and you also see the plaques and tangles that that cause that cause the, the that are caused when the hydrogen peroxide isn't broken down correctly. And our experiment was because uh, the the hyd cause the catalase has um, iron in it that different we tested um, in a project that of uh, different metal ions reacted with it, but and the, and um, because of the iron and then we tested as well that if the B2, uh, the, not the B2, the, if the vitamins um, reacted with it too because of the B12 is cobalt which is which is a metal which would also, part, we were testing as well with the iron as well and so we have, we done it, we did, Kayleigh will explain the method. We did it by uh, getting catalase from a potato and we got that from a raw potato and we juiced it in the juicer and then we had a filter. We then had 10 cubic centimetres of hydrogen peroxide and a boiling tube and we used the oxygen centre to, to test the oxygen level of the vitamins and when it was in the hydrogen peroxide and we worked out that uh, B2, B6 and B12 uh, sped up the decomposition of the hydrogen peroxide and that B1, B3 and vitamin C was an inhibitor. As a non-scientist I'm just blown away by that. How on earth do you know where to start? Well it sounds very complicated but it's actually quite simple. It's all using the big word that makes it sound very complicated but it's just um, there's chemicals that are in your brain that can damage but your body usually tries to fight them but 
sometimes if you, if there's an imbalance of uh, like say metal ions in your body or if there's an imbalance of vitamins that it can affect these things that break break it down which can do that uh, that which can the thing that can lead to Alzheimer's there's obviously a massive amount of work in this project how long have you actually been at it well we've started it last September so we did and we were testing the metal ions in and we thought we would carry it on a bit longer, so we decided to change the metal ions to vitamins to see how their reaction was. So, b about t two years now altogether. Had you any idea of what you might find before you started, or was that all new? Well, in the in the one about the if, in the metal ions, there was always an old wives' tale about, um, like, say, using aluminium pots is bad for you, and so we actually proved that this is true. That it slows down the breakdown of the hydrogen peroxide, which leads to the pattern tangles in your brain, which is one of the leads to Alzheimer's. So, where do you go from here? Well, we're hoping to carry our project on and get further detail and use probably more vitamins than that, and just keep going and probably just do better with it. Is it something do you think that has a commercial um, side to it? Well, you see, um, in the vitamins, there is we we use to make the solutions. We used um, we use the record da recommended daily amount, but the market ba daily recommended daily amount mightn't be enough, or it might be too much. So we need to see how we need to find uh, how accurate the RDA is and how it affects the whole body, rather than just like say uh, say there's some like if you're sick or something, you may take more of that vitamin, but that vitamin might have a, a different a different effect that you mightn't see like a, straight away. Is that type of thing is to uh, which it's just big good research into RDA and stuff because we don't because we don't know what we're taking. It's just it's just taken from what it says in the packet basically. Victoria. And the school? St Mary's College in Derry. Uh, tell me a little bit about your project. Well our project is how uh, can contact lenses protect your eyes against UV rays and we found out that they can. We tested two types of um, contact lenses. One's uh, one day AccuView and you use them once and then throw them away at the end of the day and the other one's frequency and you can use them up to two weeks and uh, we were testing which one was the best and we found out that the frequency contact, le contact lenses were the best ones to use because you can use them for longer and it's the same protection every day and uh, what we did we used a light source that it only gives off a UVA uh, ray but the light sensor picks up UVA and UVB so uh, it, it did pick up that it does protect your eyes against both of the rays, so your eyes are protected against the sun. But the contact lens only protects your iris and your pupil. It doesn't protect your sclera, the white part of the eye. And we uh, we figured out that we get you get um, yellow growths in the white on the white part of your eye if you don't wear because it's not getting protected. So um, we were just seeing if there was anything we could do to prevent it. But we haven't found out anything yet, but we did find out that the contact lenses are better than glasses because with glasses the UV rays are getting through the sides, tops and bottoms of the glasses and the contact lenses just completely cover your pupil and iris. So we found that out and then we're, our next uh, step is to do blue light. And it's just literally a blue light. It's next to the UV, the UV rays on the EM spectrum. And it's above 400 nanometers. And uh, they, it's as penetrating as UV rays. And it could be as harmful. So we just wanted to see if you could get cancer or anything of that and see if you could um, do any ways to protect it. Fascinating. <laughs> How did you think of the project, the, the uh, concept behind it? Well, there's more people every year swapping glasses for contact lenses. So uh, we just wanted to see if they were getting the same protection and they're actually getting more protection from contact lenses than they are from glasses. Saoirse. And the name of your school? St Mary's College, Derry. Saoirse, tell me a little bit about your project. Um, well, I've used four tablets to come up with a handy method for consumers who have to pay for their prescription 
and go on the internet so they know exactly what they're buying, uh, so they know exactly how much active ingredient is in the tablet itself. The four tablets are metformin hydrochloride, which is for type 2 diabetes, uh, Crestor and Simvastatin are to treat high cholesterol levels, and Ramipril is for high blood pressure levels. I've come up with um, a way of using uh, sodium hydroxide 0.3 molarities and sodium hydroxide 0.5 molarities. You put the tablet into that, that crushed and shake it so it dissolves. Uh, once it dissolves, you would put it in with the potassium permanganate and shake it. Uh, there would be an immediate colour change and then with a colour scale, you would uh, compare it and determine how much of acting of ingredient is in it. So you know exactly how much. If it's a different colour from the, what the colour scale says, it would be either too much, too little, or there mightn't be any of the active ingredient at all on it. Um. How important is that to people in everyday life then? Well, it could uh, damage their health if they don't have enough or too much of it. Uh, so can. And is this because there are um, different tablets made by different companies that profess to do the same thing? Is that what's behind it? Um, no, it's more for the counter counterfeit uh, tablets on the internet. Because you can't always trust what's on the internet. And have you sort of proven then that there is a lot of that stuff about? Um, I haven't actually proved it at the minute. Um, I'm using just the prescribed tablets um, so I can get a, an accurate re uh, reading from the colour. Um, I, I will repeat the, uh, the test again to make sure that it's accurate. And how long have you been at the project? Um, I started it in September 2010. <laughs> so I have. Well, you're obviously passionate about it. Was this an idea of your own? Yeah, it was. I uh, seen it uh, broadcasted like on the news and stuff, and saying about the counterfeit tablets and stuff, and how um, I thought that it'd be good to realise or for consumers to know what they're actually buying. Okay, girls, and your names? Megan, Kiara, and Adele. And the school, please. St Mary's College, Derry. So tell me a little bit about your project. For our project, we tested how much UV light was absorbed in tea and coffee because of the caffeine. Then we decided to take the project further and make our own uh, coffee based on cream. Uh, the way we did this is that we, we made up different solutions of coffee and tea and we decided to test and see how much of the UV light got through and absorbed the actual UV light. So after that then we decided to make our sun cream and our target SPF was 15 but the SPF we got was 17 so we reached our target and a wee bit further than that. So. Making the sun after making solutions we made the sunscreen and we got the recipe off aromantic.co.uk which is a natural based sunscreen. And we added the tea and the we added the tea into the sunscreen and then coffee, and we tested it. We found that more caffeine in the coffee and the tea, which means more UV light has been absorbed. What on earth made you think of using that? We were online uh, reading articles and we came across one about saying that caffeine absorbed UV light, but we didn't know about this, so we decided to make a project, test it, then take it further and test against tea and decaffeinated coffee. And how long have you been working on the project? We've been working on it since September and finished it near the end of December, sort of January, so it's been a long process, but it was well worth it. Do you hope to be able to take this further than just the competition then? Yeah, we went to the patent and we asked, because we were told that maybe this was the first time it was done. And for further research, we're going to see if we can test chocolate then. For caffeine and the chocolate, they absorb the UV light and the sunscreen.